Is it offensive to the design team to call their graphics card a brick? I mean, it's it's a very pretty looking brick, but come on, the RTX 5090 Aorus Master, you know, it's a brick. It's, it's very rectangular. But like I said, despite being a very brick shaped, more so than your average graphics card, I think this thing does look pretty good. And well, whether looks are important to you or not, when it comes to performance, this model is exceptionally good. We'll get to the performance data in a moment, but before we do, let's take a look over the Aorus Master, and then of course, we'll tear it down to take a look at some of the special source. Firstly, the dimensions. As you can see, it's big. And by big, it measures 360 millimeters long, 150 millimeters tall, and then 75 millimeters wide. So like most RTX 5090s, this thing is a big boy. Oh, and it also weighs a hefty 1,750 grams. The front side of the card is wrapped in a plastic fan shroud with a few holographic decals. Not sure if holographic is the correct term to use here, but you can see what they look like in this shot here. So I guess call them what you wish. Then embedded within the shroud are three 110 millimeter fans. Hawk fans is what Gigabyte calls them. And as we often see, the centrally located fan spins clockwise while the outer fans spin counterclockwise as this configuration reduces air turbulence and therefore noise. The Hawk fan features a unique blade design which Gigabyte says is inspired by the aerodynamics of an eagle's wing. So sure, I guess. Essentially, this design incorporates strips on the blades which are said to reduce turbulence. The tips of the fans are also lifted upwards to prevent backflow, which is said to increase air pressure and reduce noise. Then finally, at the leading edge of the fan blade are small surface mounts, which are said to create air vortices to increase wind speed. All said and done, Gigabyte claims air pressure is increased by a precise 53.6% and airflow volume by 12.5% when compared to a more traditional fan blade design. Finally, the fans also include Gigabyte's RGB halo feature. The three ring lighting provides a unique look via a range of awesome visual effects. And this is the design element that really makes the Gigabyte graphics card stand out from the pack in my opinion. Obviously, if you hate RGB lighting, this won't do too much for you. And admittedly, I don't really care too much for it, but then even I have to admit this does look pretty neat. Now moving around to the side of the card, so the angle you're mostly going to view when mounted in a traditional position, so I guess horizontally, there's more RGB lighting here. And if that's not enough, there's also an LCD screen. The RGB lighting stuff is pretty self-explanatory. As for the LCD though, you can use that to show stuff like GPU temperature or custom images, like your favorite memes, for example. So pretty epic stuff there. Other than all that RGB and LED stuff, you get a glimpse at the massive heatsink as well as the die cast metal frame that protects the card. There's also a dual bar switch and the 12 pin high powered connector. The dual bias lets you switch between the default performance bias and then a silent bias. Then at the side opposite the IO panel, so I guess technically kind of the back side of the graphics card, it's very neatly wrapped. It's a basic design here, but it is clean and tidy. And there's a few mounting points here for the GPU holder. Speaking of which, unlike MSI and ASUS, Gigabyte has actually included a good GPU support. Whereas MSI and ASUS both used a GPU stand that doesn't really attach to anything, just a magnetic leg, I guess you could call it. So when you move your system, they're likely to come loose and just smash around in your case. And therefore, you would want to remove them prior to any kind of transport. The Gigabyte mount, though, on the other hand, that screws into the side of the card, which not only secures it much better so that it can't come loose, but it also moves it out of sight. There's also significantly more height adjustment on offer here, making it a superior support in every conceivable way. Around at the IO end, we find a triple bracket adapter with a large cutout for airflow, along with three display port outputs and an HDMI output. Then completing our external look at the Aorus Master is the backplate, which covers the entire length of the card, but does include a huge cutout for air to pass through. The backplate has been painted matte black, but it does have some glossy details along with more holographic elements. And overall, I think it looks quite good. Gigabyte's also cut out the bit around the power connector, which makes it very easy to install and remove the power cable. And this was something MSI didn't do. 
and I feel given the potential issues with the 12-pin high-powered connector, this approach from Gigabyte is just much better. Finally, Gigabyte has also included a 120mm RGB case fan, which seems a little bit odd to include with the Aorus Master, and I guess once you learn why, you could say it is a bit odd. That's because this additional fan can be mounted on the back side of the card over the air pass-through area, and this is done to increase air pressure, which should improve thermal performance, likely at the cost of operating volume though. So whereas ASUS went with a four fan design for the Astral cards, Gigabyte has made this a flexible option, which looks like a bit of an afterthought, I have to admit, but as an optional extra, I guess why not? Okay, so now it's time to tear the card down, and please note all testing was conducted prior to the teardown. Now, pulling apart the Aorus Master is quite a bit easier than other 5090s, because you don't have to apply a tremendous amount of pressure to slowly break the seal created by all the thermal pads. And this is because the Aorus Master doesn't include a single thermal pad on the entire graphics card. Rather, Gigabyte has opted for thermal putty along with composite metal grease. The composite metal grease has been used on the GPU die, and because it is electrically conductive, Gigabyte's installed a dual layer gel fence to avoid the metal grease coming in contact with any of the surface mount components, which would risk shorting out the card. Then for the VRAM, power delivery components and other critical components, Gigabyte has used non-electrically conductive thermal putty or thermal conductive gel. The advantage of this putty-like material is that it's highly malleable allowing it to fill gaps between components, even on uneven surfaces, allowing for maximum contact and therefore efficient thermal transfer. In a nutshell, this should mean the thermal performance of the Aorus Master is going to be excellent for all components. But it also means servicing this product is considerably more difficult, and while I'm not questioning the longevity of these compounds, as I don't really have any insight into that, it does mean that if you have to tear down the card, you will need to remove all of that putty and then reapply it. So for now, I'm going to have to remove all of it, but of course I have done my testing, and then we will reapply it and put the card back together. Before that, let's quickly go over the PCB, which measures 230 millimeters long, and on board you'll find 31 monolithic MPS power stages, 24 for the GPU and 7 for the memory. I'm not exactly sure what these models are rated for, as I was unable to obtain that information in time for this review. Now, the heatsink weighs in at 1,450 grams, and as you'd expect, it is very large, making up the bulk of the Aorus Master. Embedded within the heatsink is a large copper nickel-plated vapor chamber, which makes direct contact with the GPU, but uses an aluminium spacer for the memory chips. In total, there are 13 copper heat pipes, which are used to move heat away from the vapor chamber and disperse it via the many aluminium fins. Then helping tie everything together and protect the PCB from flexing is a die cast metal frame, which weighs 244 grams. So now that we've torn down the card for a good look at the components and how Gigabyte has configured the cooling, let's move on to see how it works. And again, please note all of this testing was conducted prior to the teardown. Here's a look at how the Aorus Master operates after an hour of playing The Last of Us Part 1 at the 4K resolution using the maximum in-game quality settings. These temperatures were recorded in a 21 degree room inside an ATX case with the doors closed. Here we see that the GPU hit a peak of 65 degrees with a fan speed of 1400 RPM. We also saw the GDDR7 memory peak at 70 degrees, so these are great results given the GPU consumed on average 496 watts during our test, and the cores operated at 2890 megahertz. Then if we switch from the performance BIOS over to the secondary silent BIOS, the fan speed drops to just 1200 RPM, and now we're seeing a peak GPU temperature of 72 degrees and a peak memory temperature of 76 degrees. Now, time for some overclocking. By default, the Aorus Master has a boost clock of 2655 MHz and operates the memory at 28 gigabits per second. I was able to overclock the cores to 2815 MHz and the memory to 30 gigabits per second. Under load, these settings allowed my Aorus Master to reach a stable core operating frequency of 3045 MHz, which resulted in an average power draw of 502 watts while the memory ran at 30 gigabits per second. This increased the GPU temperature to 70 degrees and the memory to 74 degrees with an auto fan speed of 1200 RPM. 
Here's a quick look at how the Aorus Master compares with MSI's Supreme Air and liquid-cooled models, along with NVIDIA's Founders Edition. Stock of the Aorus Master ran 2 degrees cooler than the Supreme SoC and 8 degrees cooler than the FE model. Then when switched over to the secondary silent bus, the Aorus Master ran 5 degrees cooler than the Supreme SoC, but 17 degrees hotter than the Supreme Liquid. Now, if we noise normalize to 40 decibels, the Aorus Master ran 6 degrees cooler than the Supreme SoC, and just 10 degrees hotter than the Supreme Liquid. It was also a massive 14 degrees cooler than NVIDIA's FE model. As for the memory temperatures, the Aorus Master was much better than the FE model, running 18 degrees cooler, coming in 2 degrees cooler than the Supreme SoC. Then when noise normalized, the Aorus Master ended up running 24 degrees cooler than the FE model, as it was able to match the Supreme Liquid, so a very impressive result there. Now for some gaming benchmarks, and we'll start with Dying Light 2. Out of the box, the Aorus Master is 5% faster than the Founders Edition model, and that actually made it 2.5% faster than MSI's Supreme cards, though once manually overclocked, it roughly matched the overclocked Supreme Liquid. Performance in Delta Force was right where you'd expect, matching the MSI models, making the Aorus Master 6% faster than the FE model. Then with the manual overclock applied, we received an average of 177 FPS, which allowed it to match the overclocked Supreme Liquid. Lastly, we have Marvel Rivals, and here the Aorus Master matched the Supreme SoC out of the box, and the same was also true once both cards were manually overclocked. Now when it comes to power consumption, the Aorus Master is a hungry graphics card, though it did use less power than the MSI models, up to 10% less in our testing. Well, the Gigabyte Aorus Master is certainly an impressive air-cooled RTX 5090 graphics card, possibly the best performing model out there, but of course we are yet to look at all of them. In fact, we've only looked at a few of them so far, but I imagine this one is going to be very difficult to beat. Gigabyte's choice to go with Thermal Putty and Metal Grease, I think that's paid off. And while these things do make servicing the card a nightmare, the hope is, of course, that you'll never actually have to do that. Certainly not within an acceptable lifespan for this particular product. I'm also a fan of how this model looks, and those RGB fans, they're a bit special. Gigabyte has also done an excellent job with the GPU support, far better than the likes of MSI and ASUS, so that's a functional feature where Gigabyte scores big with me. So overall, the RTX 5090 Aorus Master is a well-designed, well-made graphics card with excellent features. The only problem, of course, remains availability and the asking price. Right now, you can expect to pay $2,750 US for the Aorus Master, and that's assuming you can find one in stock, which you almost certainly can't. As it stands, that's the same asking price as the MSI Supreme SoC, and as good as the MSI model is, I feel the Aorus Master is even better. Still, both do perform very well, and if you prefer the look of the Supreme SoC, then that might be your preference. Finally, for those of you who are going to complain that I'm spending time reviewing a graphics card that you can't really buy right now, and certainly not for a reasonable price, well, I have to say I'm surprised you've made it this far. But if you did, the idea is to see how these various RTX 5090 models stack up. So for those of you who do want to buy one eventually, when they're available at a reasonable price, you know which model best suits your needs. So that's the point of reviewing a product. And with that, I'm going to end this video. Uh, if you'd like to get more Harbour Unbox goodness, we have the join button or uh, the link to Patreon where you can sign up to our exclusive, or sign up to get exclusive access, no, not exclusive access, access to our exclusive Discord server. See, you get, I know what I'm talking about. So we have Discord, uh, behind the scenes content, Q&A stuff, and a monthly live stream, which is exclusive for members. I did that right that time. Uh, but other than that, you know, that's going to do it. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.